to welcome everyone to Legally Bliss Conversations, and I would love to have a very special welcome to Diana Schimmel. Diana is a family law attorney and partner at the female-founded law firm Martine, Kat Scanlon, and Schimmel. She exclusively practices family law with her partners and serves clients in the greater Philadelphia, South, and Central New Jersey areas. Diana helps her divorced clients navigate that process. And the other side of her practice is family building through adoption and surrogacy work. She's married to her other half, Rocco, who's an amazing cook and unfortunate New York sports fan, and lives with him and their three-year-old daughter, Vivian, in New Jersey. Welcome again, Diana. I'm so happy you're here. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about all the good things. So why did you go to law school? Uh, that's a great question. So I think I probably had some family influence, as a lot of people do. No other real lawyers in my family, but my mom was a social worker. My grandmother on my dad's side was a police officer. So there was always this undertone of people and service. And I was a pretty big advocate as well. And probably by, you know, my parents' standards, they would say I was very bossy when I was little. No, but you're a leader now, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. The the anecdote that my mom always tells is I was in Girl Scouts and about like second or third grade, they had a career day and I could dress up however I wanted to, you know, grow up and, and be in that profession. And I chose to be a ballerina lawyer. So I wore my pink tights, my black <laughs> leotard, but then one of my mom's 80s blazers with the huge shoulder pads and a fake pair of glasses with a little, uh, you know, clipboard with a notepad. So I, I combined the two. Yeah. Okay. I think that sounds fabulous. What, have you not broken that costume out again, like in the last few years? You know, I actually kind of made it a reality when I knew I was going to law school in yeah. college, I double majored. So I did poli sci and I also did dance. So I kind of did both in real you life. Did both. I did. So how did you balance both of those majors? It was definitely tough. And I ultimately dropped down dance to a minor my junior year because it was just a lot, especially physically with the dance classes. Um, but I, I tried my best. I had a great time in college. I went to George Mason and they made it pretty easy. So okay, awesome. So, um, it sounds like you had parents and I think you said your grandfather, who was, um, an, a police officer, you, you my had grandmother. your, yeah, your grandmother was yeah. a police officer. Okay. Yeah. That's awesome. I mean, it's awesome either way, but it's really cool to see a female in that role. Right. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. And especially yeah. older, um, how have those people inspired you today? Like I always ask people kind of who their biggest inspirations are. And I'm curious, like how those people being in uh, careers of service impact you? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Obviously my parents and my grandparents had a huge impact on me. We were a very close knit family. We're a small family. Um, but I think my grandparents really instilled in my parents um, certain values and a sense of accomplishment that they needed or wanted to see from them. And then that got passed down. But with my grandmother specifically, she was a child of the depression era. And at that time, there weren't a lot of jobs. So she sat for the civil service exam when she was 21. And that's how she ended up in the police department. But because she had this voracious um, appetite for learning and for advancement, she continued on up through the ranks. But as you know, you mentioned, this was a long time ago. So this was the 60s, 70s, 80s, and there wasn't a lot of advancement for women. There was a lot of, you know, keeping us down. So she ultimately, with another friend and colleague of hers, lobbied to or petitioned to rather, I should say, uh, be able to sit for the promotions exams. And she rose through the ranks as a result of that when she succeeded. And she ultimately retired in 81 as the second highest ranking police officer, not just female. So she really paved the way. And I think her um, career path and her mentality trickled down to my dad, which then when he chose, you know, my mom as a partner, they instilled that in my brother and I. Um, and it really became something that collectively we all had as like our, our theme in, you know, choosing our own paths. Wow. I think it like her path really seems like it kind of instilled core values in you. Mm -hmm. Shout out, to, shout out to your granny. <laughs> shout out to granny is right. Is right. <laughs> yeah. Is she, it, she's still here. 
Unfortunately, she's not. She did pass away at the at a very old age. She was in her late 90s. So wow. she had a very, very full life. But there actually um, was a very large photo that my grandfather had blown up of her. It's her in her full police regalia in Jerusalem, leaning up against the Western Wall with her full outfit on kissing the wall and it's life-size almost and when she passed away that was the one thing I wanted and I now have it framed in my office so oh wow I'd love to see that I'd love yeah. to see a picture of it and share it with me at some point Absolutely. absolutely absolutely awesome so you went to law school Mm -hmm. You loved every minute of it, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. As much as one can, as much as one can. Okay. Um, How was I, it? I wouldn't say it was as bad as people, as people think. I actually had a really great time. I, I took a year off between college and law school to regroup. And I knew I was going to law school, but I just wanted to get a little bit of time under my belt to calm down. Um, and then when I went to law school, I went to Widener and it was a very, very small program. There was only 120 ish kids in my graduating class. Okay. And I think that really helped. We formed a really close knit group and I had a really core group of friends there. So while it was definitely hard, the fact that I had a lot of fun with those friends to sort of balance it out, I think really helped. Yeah. So where is that law school? I'm not familiar yeah. with. Sure. So Widener University is actually in Chester, Pennsylvania, but okay. they have two law school branches, one in Wilmington, Delaware, and one in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And I went to the Harrisburg campus. Awesome. So yes. would you recommend um, for people to take a year off between undergrad and law school? I do. I think the friends of mine in school who did not had a little bit of, of antsiness left. Um, they still wanted to have a little fun. They were still in the college mindset. Um, I think that they never got to really experience the working world mm -hmm. before they went, you know, to law school. Cause I worked at a law firm during that year. Yeah. Um, and so I got to see a little bit of a preview of what I was getting into. Um, so I think I had a little more world experience than some of the other people did. I think also just maturity, you know, we're in our early twenties at that point, And I don't think we realize what we're getting into. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I would, I would recommend it. Yeah, I think that there's a lot to be said for taking a, at least a year off, right? Mm -hmm. Or being kind of that non-traditional student mm -hmm. and going back to law school later in life. I feel like we're seeing more and more of that where people are actually choosing to do that. Whereas a lot of people kind of like me who didn't really know what they wanted to do after college. So it kind of thought, well, I'm going to try to extend this college gig out another few years mm -hmm. and fairly quickly learned that like it was not the same. <laughs> yeah, it is not the same. It is definitely not the same. I, yeah. No, I went from the dance classes yeah. to, you know, con law. So it's definitely not the same. <laughs> yeah. And, and the maturity aspect is huge. So yes. you went to law school and you said that you would work for a law firm in law school. Did you know that you wanted to go into family law or were you kind of exploring different options? I was exploring different options. At first, I thought I wanted to do contract work, which was very quickly something I did not want to do. And I learned right away I wanted to be a litigator. I participated in a trial advocacy while I was in law school, and I really liked that. And that sort of became something right away that I gravitated towards. But I ended up working for a firm while I was in school that was a medium to large size firm, but they had a ton of different practice groups. So I decided that I was going to learn in each of those practice groups what I liked. Yeah. And I really gravitated towards the family law practice group and did a lot with them and would try to, you know, work with them as much as I could. And so I, I had an inkling that that's what I wanted to, to do. Yeah. Um, I unfortunately was in school at the height of the, our last recession in the 20, you know, 2008, 2010 era and um, coming out of school, I just needed a job. So I wasn't able to focus on family law right away. Um, but five, six months after I graduated and was working in commercial litigation, I just realized life's too short. I don't want to do this. I can't, you know, be this 25 year old pushing other people's money around. I want to actually help. So I immediately switched and went into family law and never looked back. Okay. So let's talk about that switch. You were yeah. talking about doing the commercial litigation. I think it's really fascinating that you knew that you wanted to do litigation. It's so many people that, you know, I, I talk to, you know, they say they, they knew they wanted to do litigation or they tried litigation and they're like, oh my gosh, like this is not for me. So it's so interesting how some yeah. people just really gravitate towards different areas. And that's, what's cool about 
um, the practice of law, if, if there's anything. anything that's cool about <laughs> it's it. cool. It's cool. There, there are a lot of different, you know, mm-hmm. practice areas and, you know, ways of practicing law that can match different personalities. So you were doing the commercial litigation and I guess what, five or six months after you're like, okay, I've got to really just settle in here and go into the practice area that lights me up. How did that work? How did you make yeah. that happen? I think I kind of took an untraditional path because I went from, I was in Harrisburg, like I said, for school. I knew I wanted to get back to Philadelphia. That's where I'm originally from. So for me, I just needed a jumping off point. So when I was applying for jobs and the landscape of the law firm was really changing in that time because of, you know, the economics of our, of our time then. Um, So I just jumped on anything. Um, and that got me back into the city. And I figured once I was in Philadelphia, I could then make moves from there as opposed to working in Harrisburg and being a little bit more disconnected. So when I was working at this commercial litigation firm, it was very much the trope of the law firm, the old gray haired men, the mahogany bookshelves with the law books on them. And, (laughs) you know, they, they really were not kind. They were not, um, they did not treat their employees, especially female employees well. And I started to sense a lot of sexual harassment. Um, and it was very much an old boys club. So the, the wheels in my head started turning quickly that I wanted to get out. Um, and I really just took a leap and, um, they actually, when they found out that I was planning to leave, they swiftly asked me to leave myself, but, I took that as a great opportunity and just started pounding the pavement and networking and connecting. And ultimately, you know, it led me to a really wonderful clerkship with a fantastic judge. Mm -hmm. Um, And then from there, you know, my next steps, but it's always been in family law since that time. I bet you learned a ton as a clerk. Oh my gosh, a ton. It's really a bird's eye view because you get to see both sides. And my Mm -hmm. judge was so careful to show me what was what lawyers were doing well and what lawyers were also not doing well and she would say don't do this do this and she was really really influential and I thought also similar to how my grandmother was very much pro-female pro-female empowerment you know supportive of me in the legal career um both she and several of the other judges that all had chambers next to each other they really were great in welcoming me you know into the fold we even did a yoga class after work together for a while in the courthouse they brought in a yoga teacher so I I got a lot of insight from them even off hours conversations it was very a very cool experience yeah that's a, an incredible opportunity how long um were you a clerk So I did that for one year and then I was at the Philadelphia Defender Association, which is their public defender's office. They have a child advocacy unit um, and that's essentially all the kids who are involved, unfortunately, with the juvenile dependency system Um, in Pennsylvania. They have the right to their own attorney. So I represented children who were in that process. I bet you. Yeah, let's talk about that. How how was that um, opportunity for you? I think that was really where. I blossomed as an attorney and as a litigator and as a mature lawyer, um, because a lot of my friends at that time, I mean, this is my early twenties, I'm still like 25 ish. And, um, a lot of my friends were still getting coffee and pushing paper and, you know, excited to just be sitting at, you know, the council table. Whereas I was running a caseload of 150 cases, litigating in court three, four, four or five times a week, you know, managing really independently a a strong caseload and cutting my teeth as a true litigator. Um, Mm -hmm. Plus it was with a really, really great group of people also happened to be female dominated, which I I guess I keep gravitating towards that, but um, a really good group of people who were just passionate about what we did. Everyone was supportive. Um, It was a very cool experience to be in a job like that where I wasn't treated like the young kid. I was, you know, right there shoulder to shoulder with, you know, much older people and, you know, given the respect that, you know, I should have had um, at prior jobs. So it was a great, great experience. Yeah. So you said that you kind of gravitated towards these female dominated um, areas Mm -hmm. and you did ultimately start your own practice. Yes. And what's really cool about your practice is it is a female founded law firm. Yep. Did you go from that position to, to starting that law firm or were, were there some more? There were some 
bumps in that yeah, road. Yeah, yeah. So when talk about I, the obstacles, that's <laughs> let's talk about it. No, I think this is super important because yeah. I, I think you know I haven't had the most smooth career, but I wouldn't trade it. I think it made me who I am, both personally and professionally today. So. I, um, when I realized that I wasn't going to be able to support myself anymore at the child advocacy unit, which it's a shame that public interest attorneys just truly are not paid what they deserve. Um, I needed to make a change. So I jumped into private practice at that point. Okay. And I actually ran a solo practice for four years by myself, just me. Um, I, you know, found out very quickly, some good ways to make that work. Um, in terms of, you know, support staff and utilizing free legal, um, you know, clerks from law schools and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but when I got to a point where I really had plateaued and I wanted to do more, I thought about bringing on a partner. And um, I did. I actually had a very good friend and colleague of mine who um, took a while to gather her book and to feel like she could join me as an equal. Um, and she joined me for about eight months, just the two of us. Um, and then she and I actually partnered with a third person. And this is where I think the difference comes in. It was a man. And the three of us were together for about two and a half years. And that did not end well. Um, that was a very difficult business divorce, I think, um, yeah. if you can call it that. Sure. And it really, it really taught me a lot about what I wanted from my firm, how I wanted to practice, how I wanted to manage and treat clients, how I wanted to balance work life. Um, but when I left that practice, and it was pretty abrupt that I, that I left, um, I found my current partners and they were just, it was like seamless. They were perfect. We, we completely melded and mashed as if we had been together for years. And now we've been together for three years, the three of us. And it feels like forever. Uh, this is truly the only time that I have ever felt really supported in my practice. And like the three of us are equals and that we are on the same mission and mindset, both for how we want to run our business, but also our personal lives. And it's it's been nice. It's been refreshing. That's key. So I have a couple of questions about this. Of course. If you go back to when you had the, when you were solo and then you partnered up with, um, someone, I guess you, it was for a couple of years, right? It was yeah. the female and then the, the man, where did things start going wrong? Like, what did you see there? That was kind of a red flag where you're like, okay, I think that this might not work out. And then the reason I'm asking this is because I think it might help people kind of see red flags earlier on in, in partnerships like this. Yeah. I think the there were red flags from the start when we joined with the third partner. Okay. I think there's always the risk of triangulation when you have three versus two or, you know, four. Um, and I think that one of the big issues was ego. Um, I'm a very strong minded female as was my other partner, but I think that the male attorney that we worked with had some trouble with that. Um, we were also younger than him. So I think there was this sense of jealousy and ego, but from a legal perspective, I think we just had differing views of how we wanted to service clients. Mm -hmm. So family law is so delicate. It's an emotional mm -hmm. type yeah. of law. It's not the same as corporate litigation or business or real estate or any of that. So clients come to us in a little bit of a different posture. Yeah. And I started to notice that my other partner wanted to treat it more like a business and let people be more numbers rather than people. And that wasn't how I cultivated my, my practice. Mm -hmm. um, I was getting clients, not from, you know, pumping money into advertising, but from word of mouth and from referrals and from relationships. And he was starting to squash those relationships. And I didn't love that. And I didn't love how we were prioritizing what we were prioritizing in the actual firm and the day-to-day -day practice. Okay. That's fascinating. So the women that you work with now, it sounds like you all really vibe. You mm -hmm. all been together for, did you say three years now? Three years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how did you meet these women? Were they people that you had gone to law school with or just kind of in the community? I'm really curious how that really, those relationships formed. It's a great question. I actually had a case with my one partner, Sarah Martin. Um, she 
and I had a very difficult case together when I was with my prior partnership. And you know, you sometimes when you just have an opposing counsel, you vibe. You have a similar style of practice. You have a similar personality. Um, you just connect. You somewhat drop the disarming, you know, advocacy front, and you just become people about it. And she and I have built a relationship from that. And then when I was quickly trying to put my ducks in a row after leaving my last partnership, she was one of the first names that I thought of because I thought, if this is how she was to work with as an opposing counsel, how would it be if I was on the same side? Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and when I reached out to her and I called her and I just said, you know, hey, Sarah, it's Diana. I'm, I'm leaving my, my partnership. Would you guys be interested in having a conversation with me? And there was a beat of silence. And then she just said, yes, 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 yes. Mm -hmm. And we immediately put the wheels in motion. And, you know, three weeks later, I was sitting in a desk down the hall from her. Okay. So I love it. Like that's an example of like making it happen. Right. Yeah. And it seems like there wasn't a lot of, it wasn't type of, a type of relationship where it was forced, right. No. It was kind of meant to be. So, it was very organic. Yeah. Very, very organic. Um, Okay. So, and then now you have another attorney in your firm. How did, um, how did she come on board? So I think our expansion has really been organic. And that's actually one of the reasons why I love the partnership I'm in here. At my prior partnership, my old uh, partner wanted to just grow for the sake of growing, not necessarily for finding the right fit personality wise for an attorney. So um, the three partners and I, right around the time that I joined, they also brought on an of counsel. So someone who works, you know, on her own schedule somewhat independently, but she is there as well. Then we really needed an, a true associate, someone who could support us on our cases, but also handle her own. And excuse me, we started with her about a year ago. She actually clerked with us. Um, the Drexel Law School has a really great co-op program that we take advantage of where we can get uh, free legal help while they get credit for semesters. And this particular, <laughs> this particular woman was just someone who blew us away and we made her an offer and she stayed with us after her clerkship. So it was great. That's awesome. So are you all in the same office right now or are you all kind of scattered? How does that work at your firm? That's a, that's a good question. Uh, COVID and the pandemic yeah. sort of changed up our working model. Quickly, probably. Um, <laughs> yes, yes. So originally we just had the office in Cherry Hill. That was when my partners were together without me. And then when I came on board, I have more cases in different places and we, we expanded our reach. So that's when we opened two new offices, one in Princeton, New Jersey, which is the central part of the state. So that added on to the Cherry Hill practice in, in South Jersey. And then we also opened a Philadelphia office right in Center City so that I could service clients in all those areas. Wow. Um, and then now the idea is to continue to grow, not in office space. Those are the three offices. We're not looking to grow any additional locations, but to get some additional attorneys on board. Um, most of us are in the Cherry Hill office. I work out of the other two offices, but we all take advantage of working remotely. We all have kids. We all have you know, dogs, lives, <laughs> husbands, partners that we want to um, also be able to manage. And we got a nice taste of that while we were, you know, working from home during the pandemic. So we kind of are non-traditional in that sense. So I think that's really cool that you're kind of encouraging this culture of work life, like a true work-life balance, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what did, what does that look like for you and kind of the future of your firm as you bring on new people? Like, how do you integrate and integrate that? And I guess like train new people to understand what is important to you and how you all practice. That's, we actually had this question um, and conversation rather with our associate recently, mm -hmm. because we noticed she was starting to struggle with certain things, in, including time management. Yeah. Um, so first and foremost, we lead by example. I think we like to show our, our staff that, um, you know, we can manage a caseload, but if we need to leave for a doctor's appointment, we do. If maybe one day we need to leave at 12, the next day we, you know, burn the midnight oil. So it's all about a balance that way. But what we talked to our associate about and how we're, we're trying to train her is that she should be honing her own skills and her own development, but that she shouldn't be beholden to like the nine to five. So if one day she needs to come in at 10, okay, 
She just needs to know that her work product has to be done. So we're more of a deadline work product uh, based metric system as opposed to like how many hours were you in the office? Because we've really found that it doesn't mean you're more productive if you're sitting there for more hours. It really doesn't. So, yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So I know one thing that is really important to you is client service, like providing an amazing client experience. Yeah. Um, and perhaps that was part of the thing that went wrong with the, the prior firm that you had. There was an imbalance there with the other partner. Mm -hmm. uh, what does really good client service look like to you? I think it's communication. They always teach us, you know, in law school about the horror stories of those clients that, you know, sue for malpractice because they never heard from their attorney. But I hear so many stories of just not getting a return phone call, not getting a return email, missing deadlines, you know, not explaining things, just shooting off emails with scheduling notices, but not explaining what that means and the next steps or diffusing some of the nerves of what a boilerplate pleading might look like or what somebody you know, what somebody's questions are. So for me, it's communication. Mm -hmm. I like to make sure that my client hears from me and doesn't just hear from me in a clinical way. So if I'm sending them a copy of something to review, I'm talking to them about it. I'm sending them an email, inviting them to then call me on the phone about it. I'm getting back to them within a reasonable period of time. I'm if, if I say that we're going to do something by a certain date, we do that. We follow that model. I think a lot of attorneys just take the money and run and don't really follow through with communication. So people are left in the dark. Mm -hmm. And that's something that really bothers me when I hear that. Yeah, that has to be particularly scary in the divorce setting or as a family law attorney in general. Yeah, absolutely. To be like not knowing what's going on with your case. So um, I'm curious, where do you envision your law firm going? Oh, I love that question. It's fun to imagine. <laughs> yeah. Um, we actually would like to grow in terms of number of attorneys. So I envision, you know, us bringing on more attorneys to help with our practice so that we call ourselves boutique for a reason. We are not one of those firms that like, jams in cases so that nobody gets the, the right amount of attention. We specifically curate our caseloads. So I would love to be able to continue to do that while still, you know, supporting ourselves in our business model. So bringing on more attorneys, bringing on the right attorneys mm -hmm. um, who, you know, jive with our mission and our mantras um, and then continuing to work myself. But like I said, being able to be selective about who I work with and, and how much I take on mm -hmm. and being able to continue to enjoy that work-life balance I've cultivated now. So you, you mentioned curating um, your caseload. What does that look like to you? I think one of the other things I didn't love at my prior partnership was there was no ability to use discretion. Um, so any clients that came in, as long as they could pay, we were taking them. And I really didn't like that. That was not my style when I was a solo and it was not how I wanted to practice. I think you can get that one bad apple client that then sucks up all your time and your emotion yeah. and your money from, from the other clients. Right. Um, so I really like to be able to, to cultivate clients who I truly feel comfortable helping, who I know I can help. Sometimes a client just doesn't communicate with you that you don't click and, and that's okay. So when like a client comes to me for a consultation and they are almost sheepishly telling me they've met with other attorneys, I say, good, you, you should, you should yeah. find somebody who fits with you. Right. So I don't want to work with somebody who doesn't want to work with me, number one, or who's fighting the process or who's misplaced some anger at me or who I know has a goal that I just can't advocate for appropriately. Um, and I've gotten a lot better, you know, at that as I've moved into, you know, my 12th year now of practice at figuring it out earlier on and making the call to say, look, I, I think you might be better served from somebody else. And that's okay. Yeah, I think, like, for me, the front end client vetting really has helped with some of my sanity. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. It, it absolutely. Sounds, yeah. And it, like people think, oh gosh, you know, I have to take on a client, you know, even though they're willing to pay, or maybe it is something that you can legitimately help them with. But if it's not, a, if it's not a fit, like if you have any kind of gut feeling, I feel like with a prospective client and you, you know, you really have to kind of hone in that intuition. I and not, not take the client and it's okay. Like, because there's, there will always be clients coming through. So 
And I think a lot of young attorneys make that mistake because they are so nervous that they're not going to have enough casework to keep the lights on. But, you know, and I was certainly that that attorney as well yeah. when I was yeah. a solo, but you you just hit the nail on the head. There are there are always going to be more cases. And if you cannot take the one that may be extremely difficult and suck up all your time, that opens you up maybe for three or four really great cases that can end up making you more money and giving you yes. more satisfaction and serving the clients better in those situations. So it's it, it ultimately ends up working out. It does. And those three or four clients that you give amazing service to, they're going to refer you other amazing clients. So it all really is just a kind of like a positive flywheel. So I want to ask you, um, I had asked, what do you want our listeners to know about you? Do you mind if I read this? This is, uh, sure. yeah. You said, I want female attorneys to know that over the last 12 years of practicing law has not always been easy. I came out of law school at the height of the recession and the legal world was drastically changing. Jobs were scarce. Um, and what big law looked like was evolving. That said, it I, it was still a very male-dominated boys club. Took the first job, it came out. I want them to know that I'm a fighter, staunch feminist, that I don't believe in paying the female or mommy tax, and I want total equality for myself and other females in our fields. Okay, I absolutely love that, but I'm curious when you say you don't believe in paying the female or mommy tax, I'm curious, what does that mean to you? Yeah, so the female or the mommy tax is obviously the the pay inequality. So I, I work for myself. I don't necessarily face that, but I will tell you that there are a lot of young female attorneys who go out and don't know what compensation to ask for or the correct compensation to ask for, or even attorneys in my posture don't know how to set their correct hourly rates, don't know how to ask for money. That was something that they didn't teach us in law school. You have to be able to value your time and your expertise and stand by it. People are going to try and get anything they can for free. So you need to value your consultation time, your work product, the expertise and advice that you're giving to people. So I think that's number one. And sometimes female have females have been conditioned to, you know, sort of bring themselves back down and, you know, settle for less than. And I don't think that that's something we should abide by. Um, and then the mommy tax is more, you know, we want to be able to have families, but we also don't have access to support for maternity leave or parental leave or childcare, or if you need to step aside and, and breastfeed while you're taking a deposition, like there's, there's not a whole lot of support for that. So I, I very much strongly believe that we should support other women to encourage them to not only build their families as they want, but also support them when they come back so that they can continue to advance in their careers and don't feel like they have to take a step backwards just because they had, you know, a child and were out on maternity leave. Um, and that's, you know, a big, a big issue that I think we're facing now in general, especially with our current, you know, climate and the Supreme Court decisions that have come out that I, I really, really, really want women to, to assert themselves in that way and not leave before they need to, not feel like they can't take enough time with their children, not be afraid to come back to a job and ask for some accommodation. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I'm the breadwinner in my household. My husband's an engineer and he does very well, but I'm the breadwinner. So when I think about maternity leave, I mean, that's scary for our household. So I, I want other women to think about that as well and to ask for what they deserve. Yes. And I, it's so funny. You just took the words right out of my mouth. I was getting ready to say, ask for what you want. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm curious, do you have a couple, do you have another minute? I want to be respectful. Of course. Of time. I am wondering like if you could write a letter and give yourself a piece of advice the day that you graduated from law school, what would you tell little Diana, like, right. When, <laughs> when she's like so optimistic and happy and she's got her lovely, you know, robe and cap on what would you what would you tell her knowing what you know now yeah I would tell her to trust her gut more I think that there that there were some hurdles yeah. that could have been avoided had I just trusted my gut and had confidence in myself and my intuition I think that's number one mm -hmm. I would also tell her that it's not going to be an easy road but not to give up because of that but to keep fighting I think um a lot of my generation and I, I guess I'm technically an, a geriatric millennial, but I refuse to accept <laughs> that. I refuse to accept that. Um, but I think a lot of us had this idea growing up that like it was just going to be you keep putting one foot in front of the other 
keep doing the right things, keep meeting the, the metrics, and then everything will just be easy for you. And that's not how it goes. So I would tell her that it may be difficult, but not to, to give up, to keep going. Okay. I love that. So where can people find you, Diana? Sure. So our website is familylawmks.com. You can find us there. Um, I, we also have a Instagram. We post pretty funny memes. Um, we just get a kick out of um, some nerdy legal jokes, but some information there as well. That's at MKSS Family Law. That's on Instagram. Okay. Um, they can find me at D Shimmy um, on Instagram as well. I share a lot of content, um, family law related and otherwise, um, on my personal page. Um, and, you know, they can search any of those places, of course, you know, phone and, and email, but I find that most people search their lawyers by social media now. So that's probably the best place. That's awesome. Okay. So shimmy is your, um, Instagram is D S C H I M M Y. And I will have the links to those in the show notes associated with so people can, can find you. So Diana, thank you so much for just hanging out with me and sharing your story and your nuggets of wisdom. It's been oh, amazing. thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. It was really a pleasure. Yeah, thank you so much. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye. <laughs>